I'd just like to uh, thank Representative Garrison for uh, giving us that, and, uh, and, and I'll go right into my response. It's uh, unfortunately it's a little bit long, and I'll try to keep it brief. Uh, the voter initiative referendum process is fundamentally about getting citizens an increased voice of government and an additional check on its power. Reforms this, uh, excuse me. Unfortunately, most of the reforms that have been proposed and enacted in recent years have been in the latter type, restricting citizens' rights and diminishing the people's voice. Many of these laws have been found by federal courts to be so restricted that they violate the First Amendment. The leading stated emphasis of these restrictions is usually the prevention of signature fraud. Allegations of fraud on initiative petitions are nearly ubiquitous, being heard with almost every petition drive. To be sure, any fraud is too much fraud, and anyone who commits signature fraud should be punished to the fullest extent of the law. But a citizen charge, Citizens in Charge Foundation has found actual instances of signature fraud appear to be quite rare. I'd like to talk briefly about a few of those restrictions before getting into our findings about the reality of petition fraud. Two of the most egregious restrictions to voters' initiative rights are residency requirements and bans on paid petition circulators by the signature. Requirements that petition circulators be residents of the state or locality they're collecting signatures in have been struck down in eight different states and are currently being challenged in Nebraska and Colorado. Paper signature bans have been ruled unconstitutional in five states. In each case, courts have found that both residency and paper signature laws infringe on the First Amendment because they both reduce the amount of people av available to carry a petition and substantially drop the cost of accessing the ballot. Not only that, the courts have found that these laws to be of little effect in combating election fraud. In Oklahoma in 2008, the U.S. 10th Circuit Court of Appeals found the evidence does not support, support, and I quote, the conclusion that non-resident circulators as a class engage in fraudulent activity to a greater degree than resident circulators. Last month, a federal judge found paper signature compensation is no more likely than paper hour compensation to induce fraudulent signature gathering and block Colorado from enforcing their ban. Many other restrictions have been proposed or passed, and another popular one is forcing petition signatures to register with the state before gathering signatures. While this restriction has largely been untested in courts, it amounts to asking the government for permission to engage in free speech petitioning activity and runs counter to our American notion of free speech and open government. Surveying many of the news pieces and statements of various groups frequently alleged widespread petition fraud reveals that oftentimes the justification given for the fraud allegations is nothing more than the fact that the initiative in question goes against the political goals of those who are alleging fraud. Indeed, the F word, fraud, is a serious charge that can be very powerful to hurl a political opponent, even if it lacks truth. Because fraud allegations are used to justify restrictive policies such as those above, two important questions arise. What is petition fraud? and how do we separate allegations of petition fraud from actual instances. Oftentimes, the F word is misapplied to mix up the paperwork, hire the normal invalid signatures, or to accidental violations of petition laws that cannot qualify as attempts to deceive election officials about the validity of signatures. These are instead honest mistakes, not attempts to fraud. Examples of fraudulent actions, which I think Jennifer gave a very good uh, list of earlier, include forging signatures, paying voters to sign, coercing or tricking the voters, and the signing of the petition. It's also fraud to fill out a legal petition, or in a purposely dishonest, misleading way, whether done by a petition circulator, no public, or campaign worker. Forging a signature on a ballot petition, or fraudulently collecting a signature is a purposeful attempt to deceive elections officials or initiative opponents into accepting the signature as that of a registered voter who supports the question when in fact they do not. After finding a no fact-based assessment, of signature fraud existed, the foundation sought to find out just how much fraud was occurring. Using state open records laws, we asked attorneys general and secretaries of state in the 26 INR states, uh, there are actually 24 states that allow initiative and two additional states that allow referendum only, uh, for any instances that they had of, of verified forgery or fraud on initiative petitions. Since every one of those states has a law in the books against fraud, and because allegations are just that until proven in court, we use the justice system as our guide and only counted instances where the forgery or fraud have been verified by a court conviction. What we found was a widespread lack of signature fraud. In the 20 states that have thus far completed responses, we had a total of 17 instances of verified forgery or fraud between 1999 and 2008. That same 10-year period saw over 81 million signatures collected for a total of one fraud conviction for every 4.7 million signatures collected. <laughs> While there is very likely fraud that goes unprosecuted, and again, any fraud at all is too much fraud, the research clearly shows that fraud is not as widespread as many would lead us to believe. However, not only does this general lack of verified fraud cast out on fraud allegations themselves, 
Our research has shown that, in addition to being unconstitutional, many of the most popular negative reforms and restrictions show a potential correlation to signature fraud and certainly show to have no effect in preventing fraud. Of the five states reported fraud cases, four require, excuse me, four require petition circulators to be state residents or banned, and one banned them from being paid by the signature at the time. 16 of 17 persons convicted were residents of the state that committed fraud in. North Dakota, the state which had most cases of fraud, had both a residency requirement and a ban on per signature payments. If fraud is occurring, officials don't appear to be using existing laws to combat it. We have many lawmakers with special interests are calling for restrictions, supposedly to combat fraud. The answer to fighting signature fraud, rather than passing constitutionally suspect restrictions, which have a chilling effect on petitioning, is to prosecute identified fraud. I'll revisit our federal judge who blocked Colorado's paper signature ban last night. Finding that little resources were being devoted to using existing laws to combat fraud, he stated that, and I quote, it is reasonable to conclude that more enforcement will lead to more defer deterrence of fraud, and therefore less fraud in the ballot initiative process. The message couldn't be more clear. Prosecute fraud, don't needlessly restrict voters' rights. The concern with signature fraud is the questions that will appear on the ballot that, that do not actually have enough support to be there. As our findings on fraud show, this is a very unlikely possibility. Instead, the restrictions placed on voter rights under the auspices of fighting fraud erect substantial barriers to accessing the ballot. Citizens are forced to trade the very unlikely possibility of something being on the ballot that shouldn't be for the actuality of things being kept off the ballot that should be. Going into the next panel, I want to leave you with one thought. Often, question, often the question lawmakers ask themselves when reforming the, the initiative process is how much can we suppress citizens' right to free speech before we violate the Constitution? Whenever that's the way, those who are chosen to represent us look at our rights. It says something very profound and troubling. It shows that our elected representatives lack creativity at best and maliciously oppose citizens having a voice at worst. I submit that neither is acceptable. Thank you.